his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he is a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is an interesting passage, and we're continuing on in our Good Shepherd sermon series. And again, you can see the wonderful picture by Warner Salmon of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, the famous image. Many of you, I said, may possibly have seen before or have seen it in a church or a Sunday school room. Maybe even you have one hanging on your wall at home. But the sermon title today is The Most Awesome Shepherd. The Most Awesome Shepherd. That's a good message translation of the good shepherd (laughs) for today. Because he is the most awesome shepherd. He is the example of what a shepherd should be. And it's interesting that he's talking to the Jews, especially in the temple, in this passage and it's, it's an interesting thing that he's talking about. He's talking to them about shepherding, but he's also talking to them in a way that they should be familiar with because in their culture, this is something that was more prevalent than it is now. So he used to give metaphors and parables about things that he's trying to teach, but he tried to present them in ways that they could understand. We have trouble, even today, trying to describe God in mere human language, in mere words, because God is indescribable. But we try as we might to describe him and to limit Almighty God to the finite power. The infinite God is brought down into finite words on a page. And when he tries to reveal the wonderful news of the gospel message, and he tries to reveal the things of the kingdom of heaven, they can't grasp it. They can't really understand it if he just told them outright. So it may seem weird. Why does he have to tell them stories? Well, he has to tell them stories so that they can understand what he's trying to say a little bit better. He has to bring it down a little more to their level. We, we have different translations of Scripture now um, that are translated into different grade levels, believe it or not. Um, there's even a, uh, a translation out that is down to like a third grade reading level so that people can understand, so that the language is not so much of a barrier, and, and so that it can be easier for everyone to understand. And, and I'm not advocating necessarily that you have to bring the Word of God down to a third grade level. But sometimes the things of the kingdom of God are a little confusing and a little harder to understand. 
especially when we're looking at something from back in a different point of time, and we're sometimes in our culture now missing some of the cultural references that Jesus is giving because we don't understand those cultural references anymore. We're not in the Middle East so many, so many years ago. We're here in the United States of America in 2021. And sometimes what was described as commonplace back then isn't the, the same way for us. So let's take a look for just a moment. Let's break this down a little bit, and I'll go quickly because I know this is a larger chunk of Scripture. But it says, truly, truly. And how many of you have, have a Bible with red letters? A few of you do? Okay, well, this, most of this section is in red because these are words that Jesus actually said himself, not somebody wrote that he said, but these are words that he actually said. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. You're probably thinking, okay, this is a little strange. I'm trying to grasp this. Uh, The sheepfold is the pen where the sheep are kept. The flock is kept in this pen or the sheepfold. And he who does not enter by the door or perhaps it would make more sense to say gate. And he who does not enter by the gate into the sheep pen, but climbs in another way, like climbs over the backside of the fence basically, is a thief and a robber. The shepherd is going to come in through the front, through the gate. Anybody that's got good intentions and good purposes will know to go through the front and go through the gate. But wolves and other predators and those who might steal sheep from other people, sheep thieves, sheep nappers, (laughs) they'll be climbing over the back of the fence trying to get in so that the shepherd hopefully doesn't see and steal the sheep or kill the sheep and hurt them. But it goes on, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd of the sheep, because to him, the gatekeeper opens. This is an interesting thing that most of you might not know, but back in ancient times, when they were shepherding sheep, maybe there wasn't necessarily a gate in the opening, but that is where the shepherd would sit or lay down, or prop himself up, blocking it. So that if you wanted to get to the sheep in that pen, to that flock, you would have to go through the shepherd. And the shepherd would guard the opening from enemies, making sure that no one got in there that wasn't supposed to be. And he would also look out for predators that might be coming to kill, or steal, or destroy. But we don't get that image necessarily because we're we're not into shepherding as a culture but imagine the gateway to your life the gateway to your life is your heart basically that's where you let everything in to your life and everything comes out and it talks about in scripture about what's in our heart you know can tell a lot about what's in our minds and what's in our life what goes in we have to be careful about what we put in and we have to watch what comes out And if we're godly, good things are going to come out, right? Well, that's where Jesus chooses to lay down, is right across the gate of your heart. Guarding you from things that could come to kill, steal, and destroy your soul, and protecting you because you are his, if you will allow him to be your shepherd. It says, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Those that are in a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as your shepherd, he calls you by name. It's miraculous enough that even if you're not a Christian, that he still knows you, he still thought of you, he still brought you into existence but he knows you by name because you have a relationship with him. Isn't that comforting to know? That he loves you so much and he knows you by name. 
Then it says, when he is brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. How do we learn to know the voice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Master? Well, he left us one good way to find out, his word. He left us another good way to find out, prayer. And he left us yet another way to find out the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Satan comes to tempt, to kill, to steal, and destroy. Satan is the one in the Garden of Eden who tempted Eve and said, Go on ahead. Take a bite out of the apple. It doesn't matter what God says. When we hear voices calling us into temptation, we should be strong enough in our relationship with the Lord to say no. We don't recognize that voice. Our Savior wouldn't ask us to do something wrong or immoral. Our Savior wouldn't go against His own word and ask us to do something contrary. But it says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what He was saying. Now, granted, some of the members of the Sanhedrin and the Jewish religious hierarchy, you know, maybe they didn't bother themselves with shepherding or never had to do that before. They had people to do that maybe for them. And so they had never got their hands dirty, so to speak, doing that kind of a living. They've always had things taken care of for them. And so maybe that's why they couldn't understand, although that was a very valid reference for a very real profession in that time. But that also goes to show how sometimes the clergy back in those days did not really relate to the people. They were kind of off and to themselves, thinking that they were some kind of a holy group or a holy club that not everybody could fit into. Jesus goes on, "'Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep.'" All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. This passage also kind of reminds me with the word door and gate being inter- you know, interchanged between the two. It reminds me of another famous painting, which I'm not sure if it was by the same artist as our other one, but of Jesus knocking at the door. You've probably seen that one, right? Jesus knocking at the door. He's knocking at the door, but it's, it's proverbial of knocking at the door of our heart, asking to be let in so that he can come into our lives and change our lives. But it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. This is another verse that shows that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior, the one and only Son of God, the one and only way to God the Father. It's through Him. Because He says that anyone who enters by Him will be saved. It doesn't say He who enters by Buddha. It doesn't say He who enters by Muhammad. It doesn't say he who enters by Confucius or any other religious leaders that you might have heard of in the world. We have a Savior who is telling you the truth, who comes from God and is one with God that tells you he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, says our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from his own mouth, He will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You will be saved from your sins and your transgressions. You will be made worthy enough to stand before a holy God and you will go in and out and find pasture because He will be your Savior and your shepherd and He will lead you. The thief, it says, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it mediocrely abundantly abundantly now sometimes other fellow brothers and sisters in christ go a little wacko on some of these passages and 
And then if it's going to be abundantly, then he's going to give me an Olympic-sized swimming pool and a Mercedes-Benz or an Escalade, and and I'm going to have a 28-story mansion with 300,000 rooms and 43 bathrooms, and that's how I'm going to live more abundantly. It's not what he said. But your life is not going to be mediocre either because he promises that he will take care of every last one of your needs. You will never have to go without especially spiritually, but God will take care of His own. God says that He will take care of His own and will clothe them in more splendor like the lilies of the field than Solomon was when all of his royal robes were on. He loves you so much that He will provide for you, not with some prosperity gospel. I love those things on Facebook. If you forward this to 20 of your friends in the next 30 minutes, Jesus will bless you financially. I love the one, and I actually forwarded the one that says, Jesus will bless you financially if you get a job. Forward this to 20 of your friends. (laughs) But there's that. But it says the thief. Who is the thief? The thief is Satan. And it says that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy But Jesus comes that they may have life and have it abundantly. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. There's an I am there. When Moses was standing before the burning bush, he said, well, who am I supposed to say is telling me to go and deliver the Israelites or the Hebrews from uh, Egypt? Who am I supposed to say sent me? Tell them I am sent you. I am It's interesting that I am is a name associated with God himself, but here he is, I am, and he goes on. Just like Jehovah. Jehovah is a name for God, and then when you add the different endings on it, like Rapha, that means healing. So God, our healer, Jehovah Rapha, well, this is I am, then the good shepherd. And you can add to God's name the attributes that he is embodying. Literally, in Jesus Christ. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. How does he do that? Well, a shepherd was willing to die to protect the sheep, even if it means sacrificing his own life to protect them from a predator. Jesus loves you enough to have laid down past tense, his life for you and I to protect us from the predator of Satan so that we can be reunited in a loving relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, and he died on the cross. The cross is our gate. The cross is our door. Isn't it interesting that a cross is made of two different beams, a post and a lentil? Isn't it interesting that a door frame is made of two pieces, posts and lentils? And isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament in Egypt, that the time of Passover when it was first instituted, they sprinkled lamb's blood on the door frame? Why? So that at the gate or the door, the blood of the Lamb would be there to protect them from the spirit of death that was coming throughout the land. And that they were protected by the blood of the Lamb at the door and the gate. Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus' blood protects the door or the gate of our heart and protects us from sin and death. It says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Well, you can interpret this a lot of different ways. People who aren't really the Savior aren't going to die for you. They're going to run and they're going to hide. Like when the going gets tough, the tough get going. (laughs) Right? But then also I have this pet peeve of mine, and I, I, believe me, I'm not touting anything special for myself, but we all have callings to do in our lives. God calls each and every one of us and gifts us with different gifts so that all together as a body of Christ, we work together. Remember we talked about the beautiful bouquet of flowers and how each flower 
even though it's different, adds to the overall beauty of the bouquet? Well, some people, believe it or not, become pastors, and I kid you not, because it was a suitable career choice. Not because it was a calling from God given to them on their life. Now that doesn't make sense to me. I once heard somebody tell me that they went into the ministry because their schedule would be most compatible with their wife who was a school teacher. That was their whole reason for going into ministry and pastoring. I don't understand that. There's something more. And people who don't have any business doing the things of God, well, they have to be careful. I'm responsible for you. As your pastor, I am kind of the shepherd of this congregation, but you are not my sheep. You are Jesus' sheep. I've just been given the gift, and it is a gift, of shepherding you for a time until another shepherd at some point may be appointed or come along. But I have a responsibility while I'm here. I have a responsibility myself to seek after God and to listen for his word and to teach you the truth and to not teach you lies and to not teach you something that goes contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ or my soul is in jeopardy. But Jesus is showing that those who do not love you, will not watch over you and take care of you. But he will. He is so much for us that he gave his life for us. It says, I am the good shepherd in verse 14. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep I have others not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Now some may have interpreted this, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. That sounds weird. So Jesus has this backup flock of sheep hiding out somewhere, and he's got this one flock, but he's got a second flock somewhere else. What's that going on there? Who's he talking to in this passage? The Jews. And he says, he's trying to get them to realize that I am your shepherd. And if you will follow me, you will be saved and I will protect you. But he says that I have other sheep that are not of this fold, the Gentiles. And I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Isn't it a good thing to know that when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just for Jewish people, although he does want them to come to a knowledge of him as their Messiah, and he does want them to accept them into their heart and life also, but he died on the cross for all, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles, not just for one group, but for everyone, for you And for me. And then it says, so there will be one flock with one shepherd. One flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Now they certainly didn't understand this. I lay down my life that I may take it up again. They're thinking, what is he talking about? But you and I know exactly what he's referring to. I lay down my life on the cross for your sins and mine. He did. But I take it up again. He takes it up again because each and every Sunday is a miniature Easter Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Every time we come together, we just make a bigger production out of it on Easter Sunday. But isn't it great to know that our Lord and Savior has power and victory over death and sin? Can I get an amen? (laughs) All right. 
Because he loves you so much, he told them ahead of time what he was going to do, but they had no idea that they were going to crucify him. But it doesn't matter because he willingly went to the cross because he knew that he had to do it for you and I. But then he also knew that he was going to have victory over death and that he was going to be resurrected again on the third day. That is exciting. And then it says, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Now, he could have called in the Garden of Gethsemane 10,000 angels to come and rescue him. Take me away. Don't let me go to the cross. Don't let me be crucified. But he knew what he had to do. And he said, I lay it down of my own accord. He loved you so much, he died for you, and he chose to do so. That's the hard part. He loves you so much, he chose to die for you and I. I have the authority, he says, to lay it down, and I have the authority, praise God, to take it up again on the third day. Amen. This charge I have received from my father. They argued again, is he a demon? Well, no, because a demon couldn't heal the blind. Well, he's talking kind of wacko. Well, what do we make of this guy? Well, he's kind of a rebel. Well, should we listen to him? Well, maybe not. And while they're arguing, it says, At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. I want you to catch this because, again, things we don't understand in our cultural context right now. It was the feast of the dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. The feast of the dedication was the dedication of the second temple when it was rebuilt after the Maccabean Revolt. You'll have to Google that one if you want to find out more about that. But you might know it better as a couple of other titles. The Festival of Lights, or better yet, Hanukkah. How many of you have heard of Hanukkah? Many of you have. Did you know that it's during the Feast of Hanukkah that Jesus is saying all of this to them at the temple? Very interesting. But there's a reason for that. Probably very familiar with one of these. You probably have seen. This is a Hanukkah menorah. There are eight days, eight days that candles are lit and presents are given. Boy, don't tell your children that Jewish kids get presents for eight days in a row. Okay? The middle candle, the one that's in the center on top of the Star of David, is called the Shumash candle, the Shumash candle. It doesn't go with one of the eight days. As a matter of fact, it makes candle number nine. But the Shumash candle is the the giver of light. It's the candle that's lit first that each, every candle is lit from throughout the feast. Jesus is often referred to as being symbolic of the Shumash candle, the giver of light. The other interesting thing is if we take a look back in John chapter 8, just two chapters before where we're at now. Again, remember this is winter. This is Hanukkah. He's at the temple. He makes an unusual comment, but I'm sure it's one that you've heard. It's in verse 12 of chapter 8 of John. Again, Jesus spoke and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How many of you have heard the passage, I am the light of the world? Anybody? Sounds familiar, right? I am the light of the world. And that sounds really neat. Yes, Jesus is light. No, he's not darkness. Yes, he's the opposite of darkness. He's light. He's good. He's giving them a veiled reference to Hanukkah, to the eight-day celebration. The candles are lit in memory of the oil lamps in the temple when they ran out of oil and the oil was miraculously supplied to burn for eight days. And when he says, I 
am the light of the world, he's telling them, I am the miraculous light of the world. They got it. Would you have gotten it? Had you not known a little bit about Hanukkah, a little bit about that reference that he's trying to get across to them? And then it goes on. Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon, and it says the Jews gathered around him and said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. There are people walking around in the world today that are sa- they're in suspense. They want to know if there's hope. They want to know if there really is a Savior. They want to know if this Jesus Christ that they hear us Christians talk about is really all he says he is. But sometimes we give them a really bad example of what it is to be a Christian. We have to be really careful on Sundays when we go out to eat. We're Christians and there are people that aren't going to church so they can be there to serve us at a restaurant Possibly because they don't go to church at all. Possibly because they're so financially poor that they've got to work on a Sunday to make ends meet. And then sometimes we go and we treat them like dirt. And the waitresses might whisper, those church people, wow. (laughs) Be mindful. Be mindful. It's hard To cuss somebody out on the interstate when you've got a Jesus fish on your car? It's like when you cut them off, the first thing they see is that little fish cutting them off. (laughs) So we need to be a good witness. But he says, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. I'm telling you plainly, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the only way. If you need forgiveness for your sins, He is the answer. There is nothing that you have done in your past that can be too ashamed of that can't be brought before the Lord because He promises that those who call upon Him and recognize His voice, He said in His own words earlier in this passage, if we call out to Him and make Him our shepherd, He will what? Save us. He will save us. I told you, it says, but you still do not believe the works that I do. It says, in my Father's name, bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Isn't that comforting to know? Another gift? He doesn't have to give you eternal life. Just to give you salvation is is the biggest gift enough that he could wipe away your sins and make you able to stand before a holy God and to have a loving relationship with God the Father. Isn't that enough? But then he goes on. And then he says, not only did he say he would save you in the earlier part of this passage, he says... Also, promise number two, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Amen is right. Not only did he forgive you of your sins, he gives you eternal life with him. Hallelujah. This life isn't all there is. Thank God. (laughs) Literally. Literally. And just know that no matter what happens, the trials, the temptations, and the tribulations that come, no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. No one can take away your relationship with Jesus Christ. No one has the power to take away your salvation because He will not let them snatch you out of the palm, the nail scarred palm of his hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Isn't that good news for today? Isn't he the most awesomest shepherd you've ever heard of? (laughs) I think so. And I'd bet my life on it because he's promised me eternity with him 
and he's promised you eternity 